Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast focusing exclusively on British murder cases and serial killers. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the second episode of season 11. Listener Graham Atkins requested this case via email and I'll come on to the importance of that in just a moment. We're in the Lincolnshire village of Deeping St James this week, which lies in the East Midlands of England, around 10 miles north of Peterborough. Here are five quick fire facts about Deeping St James. Number one, it's one of five settlements that make up an area known as the Deepings, which comes from the Saxon word for deep fen or low place. For reference, the four other settlements are Market Deeping, Deeping Gate, West Deeping, and Deeping St Nicholas. Number two, Deeping St James is based around a now lost 12th century Benedictine priory, which was destroyed during Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries between 1536 and 1541. The Anglican Church of St James is located in the village and the Grade 1 listed building is the largest church in the Deepins. Number 3. There's an 18th century village lockup in the village which used to form the base of a village cross in the 15th century. Village lockups are historic buildings that were used for the temporary detention of people in rural parts of England. Number 4. Deeping Gate Bridge crosses the River Welland and links the parishes of Deeping St James and Deeping Gate. Constructed in 1651, the bridge was designed to allow horse-drawn carts to cross the river in the days when it was a busy trading route. The bridge plays a significant role in this story, so remember that for later. And finally, number 5, the land now known as the Deepins was once home to woolly mammoths and woolly rhinoceros with both species roaming the low-lying land many thousands of years ago. The approximate population of Deep in St James, according to the 2011 census, is 7,051. I mentioned the importance of the person who suggested this case to be earlier. Those of you with an eye for detail will have spotted that Graham Atkins shares the same surname as the person in this episode's title, Gillian Atkins. Their shared surname is not just a coincidence. Graham was Gillian's older brother. I was contacted by Graham back in April, around the 40th anniversary of his sister's death, and in the last week we've been in regular contact. Graham has kindly provided me with some background information about not only Gillian, but also his mum and dad, and of course himself. I cannot express my gratitude enough for Graham's invaluable contribution to this episode. His willingness to share the painful story of his sister's tragic passing has provided me with crucial insights and a profound understanding of the circumstances surrounding this case. As always, it is with the utmost respect and empathy that I approach this episode. I aim to shed light on the events that forever altered the lives of Graham and his parents. I'm honoured to be telling Gillian's story, and I simply hope that I do it justice. She deserves nothing less. Gillian Leslie Atkins was born on August 10th, 1968, but unlike her older brother Graham, who was born three years earlier on December 9th, 1965, she was not welcome to the world inside the walls of a hospital. Married couple Arnold and Elaine Atkins had Graham at Nottingham Hospital, but Gillian was born in the family's home at 75 Kirkston Drive in Loughborough. With the family now complete, the siblings spent the next few years in the Leicestershire town before moving to Deeping St James in roughly 1971-72, owing to Arnold receiving a promotion with his new role being based in Peterborough. The BT engineer likely figured a 25-minute commute was better than a 90-minute one had the family remained in Loughborough, so the move was logical. Graham and his beloved little sister Gillian spent the rest of their childhood in the village known locally as Sleeping Deeping, likely due to the small size of the village and its extremely low crime rate. It looks and sounds like your run-of-the-mill rural English village, where the only thing to worry about were local gossip. I get a vision of it being the kind of place where you could quite happily leave your doors unlocked at all times without fear of intruders entering your property, especially back in the 80s when this story's main timeline occurred. Number 7 Brownlow Drive was where the Atkins family called home. It was one of 18 detached houses on the quiet street and it was conveniently located close to Deeping St James Community Primary School and Deeping Comprehensive School, or the Deeping School as it's now known. 
Both Graham and Gillian attended the primary and secondary schools, each of which was a 10 minute walk away from the home. Graham relished his role as an older brother. He recalled taking it upon himself to look after Gillian and a group of mates while they were at Deep and Comprehensive, with anyone daring to give the gang any flack having the wrath of Graham to contend with. If we look back even further to when Graham and Gillian were six and three respectively, the siblings were taken on a once in a lifetime trip to Norway by the mum and dad. Driving all the way to the Nordic country due to a work related exchange between BT and Norwegian Telecom, the young siblings got to experience seeing the breathtaking fjords and glaciers that Norway is renowned for. Those seven weeks must have been such a delightful period of their lives. Back in Lincolnshire, the family had a couple of cats, which animal lover Gillian adored, but her true love was for horses. When she was six, Gillian was given a horse riding lesson for her birthday, and since then, she devoted her life to all things equestrian. All she could think about while stuck in school were horses. She'd much rather be out riding a majestic stallion than learning about something she had no interest in. Eventually, Gillian was given a couple of horses of her own, whom she called Cosford Rupert and Mr Kendry. That was it then. Neighbours recalled rarely seeing Gillian with her feet on the ground. She was always astride a horse. Arnold said he would rarely have a conversation with his daughter that didn't involve horses, but you can imagine how beaming she'd have been when discussing her passion with her family and friends. Naturally, Gillian pursued show jumping as a hobby and was far more than merely a competent rider. After joining the Spalding and District Riding Club in 1979 at the age of 11, she went on to win a vast collection of winner's rosettes, which she proudly displayed on her bedroom wall. She was also a member of other riding clubs, including Burley Pony Club, and was again successful in their competitions. I read in one newspaper article that Gillian was even being scouted by Olympic selectors, so she certainly had a bright future ahead of her as a show jumper. We've discussed Gillian's passion for horse riding and touched upon her close relationship with her older brother Graham, but what was she like as a person? Gillian was a gentle soul, marked by a deep compassion for all living things. It was evident from a young age that she held an innate respect for life, always going out of her way to ensure no harm came to even the smallest creatures. Her empathy was a defining trait, shining through in how she interacted with the world. A quiet girl by nature, Gillian possessed a strength that contradicted her reserved demeanour. It took time for her to open up to others. Her shyness acted as a sort of protective shield around her heart. But, once her trust was established, those fortunate enough to know her were greeted with a warmth and sincerity that left a lasting impression. In primary school, Gillian was the embodiment of dedication and consistency. Arnold and Elaine's unwavering support provided a sturdy foundation for her to excel academically, even if she'd rather be at the stables caring for her horses. Teachers admired her persistent work ethic. As a member of the Recorder Club and an avid participant in athletics, she demonstrated a remarkable ability to balance her studies with extracurricular activities. Gillian had a knack for making meaningful connections. Her interactions were always marked by a genuine interest in others. She was a reliable presence in her tutor group, offering support and friendship to her peers. Upon entering secondary school, Gillian continued to be a model student. Known for her punctuality and responsible approach to her studies, she made the most of every moment. Her sensible attitude towards events, both in school and in life, reflected a wisdom beyond her years. Her circle of friends held her in high regard, cherishing the moments they spent together. She provided both joy and comfort, a testament to the beautiful soul she was. Even now, her absence is deeply felt by those who were fortunate enough to call her a friend. This is evidenced by a Facebook group memorial page for school friends of Gillian. The page is still very active today, more than 40 years after Gillian's death. The phrase, gone from our sight but never forgotten, displayed on her tombstone, reiterates just how much she meant to the local community. Gillian was also a dedicated athlete at school, with her penchant for sprinting exemplifying her determination and drive. She proudly represented her group in various athletic pursuits, demonstrating a tenacity that inspired those around her. 
her trip to France in her second year of high school, exploring the scenic Ardennes with fellow pupils, undoubtedly left a lasting mark on her adventurous spirit and was likely one of her fondest memories. In her later secondary school years, Gillian's course selection reflected her diverse interests. Homecraft, French, geography, commerce, typing and, of course, biology were all chosen with purpose. Biology held a special place in her heart due to its connection with animals, as she wanted to learn as much as she could about them. On March 22nd, 1983, Graham bought himself a car after passing his driving test first time. Relishing in running his little sister Gillian around anywhere and everywhere, Graham would only have the chance to do so for a little over three weeks. Just 23 days after purchasing his Mini, the Atkins family's lives would change forever, as would the Deeping St James communities. That brings us to Thursday, April 14th, 1983, where our main timeline this week begins. Gillian's day was filled with preparations for some upcoming local Jim Carner events that weekend at Mill Lodge Equestrian Centre in Wisbeach, Cambridgeshire and Irby Hall in Waplord, Lincolnshire. Jim Carner is an equestrian event consisting of speed pattern racing and timed games for horse riders. She spent some precious moments preparing with her beloved ponies in their fields at Spalding Road and Eastgate, ensuring they were ready to shine and earn some more rosettes to display on her wall. Upon returning home, Gillian settled in and chose to unwind by watching an episode of Top of the Pops. The anticipation of the Jim Carner events likely weighed on her mind, so taking some time to relax and zone out would have been much needed. At around 7.45pm, Gillian ventured out to Sam's Off Licence, a local shop located on Rycroft Avenue, of which she was a regular customer. The 15-minute walk was one she'd made numerous times before. The offie held a sense of comfort and familiarity for Gillian, often serving as a backdrop for evening outings with her brother or school friends. When she left home that night, there was no indication that the routine errand would be any different from the others, albeit she was alone. Still wearing her riding gear, Gillian's only purchase from the shop was a packet of crisps. The shop's owner, Sam Parbert, greeted her as she entered, and the pair shared the briefest of exchanges before she left shortly after 8pm. Sam had no idea that would be the last interaction he'd ever have with Gillian. Roughly an hour later, at approximately 9pm, Gillian was last spotted standing alone on the aforementioned Deeping Gate Bridge in the heart of the village. Overlooking the calm waters of the River Welland near the Bell Tavern, she was observed by two of her school friends. The scene was tranquil, yet there was a subtle air of mystery surrounding her presence at that moment. Was she planning on meeting someone? Was the landmark bridge being used as the meeting point? Those, as well as several others, were all questions that would go unanswered for a good while. Back home, Elaine was growing more worried by the minute. By the time 9.30pm came and went, her concern grew exponentially. Enlisting the help of Graham, they embarked on a frantic search throughout the village. It was unlike Gillian to be out so late, especially without prior notice and on a school night. 17-year-old Graham was in the sixth form at the time and was halfway through studying for his A-levels. Despite their best efforts, Elaine and Graham found no trace of Gillian. Their calls of her name went unanswered. Returning home empty-handed, the urgency of the situation significantly increased. Recognising the gravity of the situation, Elaine contacted the local authorities, Lincolnshire Police. A missing person inquiry was promptly launched, with over 40 dedicated officers assigned to the search party. They were determined to unravel the mystery of Gillian's disappearance and bring her home safe and sound. Every nook and cranny of the village was scoured, but they were no closer to finding Gillian than when Elaine and Graham looked for her hours earlier. Sleeping Deeping was suddenly awake and in the midst of a nightmare. Gillian's body was found just 18 hours after she was last seen on the bridge in the back garden of number 78A Church Street, a mere few hundred yards from her home. Eric Butterworth, the property's owner, returned home from a day's work, unaware of the tragedy that awaited him. As he peered into the back garden, he initially mistook Gillian's body for his son John's girlfriend, Sue, who he assumed was soaking up the sun's rays in the warm spring afternoon. Unbeknownst to Eric, the calmness and normality of the scene were soon to be shattered by the grim reality of what he was about to face. 
Courtesy led him to venture outside with the intention of offering Sue a cup of tea, but it was at that point the truth revealed itself. The figure before him was not Sue. It was the lifeless body of a young girl with facial injuries so brutal that they must have been inflicted by a third party. Now thrust into a state of shock and panic, Eric ran back into his home and called the police. Eric's house on Church Street had a unique feature which stood it apart from the others. It had a gate which opened onto a lane at the back of the garden, meaning access could be gained by anyone who knew that little detail. The rest of the houses nearby had fully enclosed back gardens, which implied that whoever was responsible for killing Gillian was likely someone local who knew the layout of the land and was familiar with the area. The post-mortem examination provided a chilling account of the brutality Gillian had endured. Her official cause of death was determined to be a combination of hemorrhage and shock, both stemming from a total of four devastating head wounds that fractured her skull. At first, detectives working the case refrained from disclosing whether she had been subjected to a sexual assault. More on that shortly. In the immediate aftermath of Gillian's murder, the community was gripped by a sense of fear and uncertainty. With a killer on the loose, parents were urged to exercise extreme caution and keep their children indoors. The search for a murder weapon extended to the nearby River Welland. A five-man dive team scoured the depths of the river, whilst on land, tracker dogs were brought in to aid the search. Graham recalled that time in the immediate aftermath of discovering Gillian's body. He said, The scene at home I will never forget. I can relive every minute. Parents being sedated, the house full of police. The detectives from Grantham CID were excellent. Curiously, on the Thursday Gillian disappeared, a local circus came to the village and set up its big top in anticipation of a busy and lucrative weekend. Circus Galaxy was owned by the Lincoln-based Verlaine family and their partner, former journalist Bernard Bale. A fair had only left the village a couple of weeks before, but the strange thing about Circus Galaxy was that once they cottoned on to the fact Gillian's body had been discovered on the Friday, they packed up and left. That seems both suspicious and logical at the same time. You probably would want to get the hell out of there in their situation, but it didn't look good to the detectives working the case. Detectives subsequently interviewed the circus owners and the staff who worked on the evening of April 14th, but they were soon discounted as suspects. The Verlaine family said they had nothing to hide and complied with the detectives' requests. A police spokesperson said, The fair appeared in the village and then split up. We have interviewed members because we need to trace everyone who was in the area at that time. With the circus theory dismissed, the next thought was that Gillian must have known her attacker because she wasn't the type of person who would just wander off down an isolated lane with a stranger. She was too switched on for that, and as we know, her shy disposition meant the theory of it being someone she didn't know was highly unlikely. Arnold Atkins then took to the media in the hope of persuading anyone with information to come forward. He said, I implore anyone in the village who has information about this terrible tragedy to contact the police. One could only imagine the heartbreak he, Elaine and Graham were experiencing. In total, the police spoke to over 12,000 people during their inquiries, which equates to just over 3,500 homes in the four Deepings villages of Deeping St. James, Market Deeping, West Deeping and Deeping Gate. A week after Gillian disappeared, a fellow 14-year-old pupil at Deeping Comprehensive walked the final known route she took that fateful night, with police officers following her in tow. They spoke to locals as they walked through the village. The walk was around a mile, and images of Tabitha walking the route made the papers, with the Peterborough Evening Telegraph offering £1,000 as a reward for information leading to the arrest of Gillian's murderer. £1,000 in 1983 equates to just over 3.2k as of August 2023. That's according to the Bank of England Inflation Calculator. If you're wondering what happened to Gillian's two beloved horses, Cosford Rupert and Mr Kendry, they were reportedly taken in by the Farrell family. Peter and Pat Farrell's children shared a horse paddock with Gillian and they were family friends as a result, so it seemed like the most logical thing to do. One article I read stated that a pony was donated to a disabled riders group in Gillian's memory, but I'm unsure if the donated pony was one of Gillian's two. 
Finally, on April 28th, a man was arrested in connection with Gillian's murder after initially being questioned during the course of routine inquiries on April 25th. On May 3rd, 1983, that same man made an appearance at Bourne Magistrates Court and was formally charged with Gillian's murder. He was Robert James France, a 28-year-old bricklayer living at 9 Deer Park Road in Langtoft, a village located three miles northwest of Deeping St James. The detectives were correct. He was a local. You know by now that I like to provide as much background and context for the perpetrator as possible, as I believe it helps us better understand how they got to the point of committing murder. In France's case, there's just simply not enough information out there. I know he had a series of convictions prior to killing Gillian that dated all the way back to his teenage years, but the details surrounding those convictions are severely lacking. I know he was a keen burglar, which led to his continued downfall before this story's events, but what's more shocking is that at the time of killing Gillian Atkins, he was out on bail. He even appeared at Stamford Police Station around 6.36pm to sign a bail form on the evening of April 14th, the same night he murdered Gillian. After signing the form, he was spotted by several witnesses wandering around Deeping St James, seemingly without a care in the world. My understanding of how France came to be arrested is as follows. During the course of their searches of the areas surrounding where Gillian's body were found, detectives were made aware of a footprint being recovered from a derelict chapel. The footprint were unique because the shoe which made it was defective due to the sole being partly worn away. The impression matched a trainer owned by France, so I'm assuming that's what led to his arrest three days after detectives first spoke to him. Once Gillian's body was released to her family, they could proceed with her funeral, which occurred on May 13th, 1983. Taking place at Deeping St James Parish Church, over 250 people attended the 20-minute service, and it was conducted by Reverend Stanley Hayworth. Graham said, on the day of her funeral, the whole of both villages lined the streets and the church was full. A lot of teenagers from Deep and Comprehensive attended. Only one hymn was sung during the ceremony. It was Morning Has Broken, one of Gillian's favourites. Whilst on remand and waiting for his trial to begin, France was advised by his solicitor that he'd received an anonymous letter. It read, It was not Mr. France who killed that girl. I was watching them making love in the garden. I want everyone to know that Mr. Franz is not to blame for her death. I also want to clear and put a part of my mind at rest. I cannot let an innocent man be responsible for my actions. Please tell Mr. Franz I am sorry for what I have done to his girlfriend and what I have done to him. I want to tell you where I have put the brick. It is in that old building at the end of the pathway near where the girl was found. I put it under a couple of bricks. I think the building is an old church. The implication was that France was innocent and a third party was responsible for murdering Gillian Atkins. Here's the thing though, a fingerprint was recovered from the letter which matched France's. Officers also found white envelopes, writing paper and a pen in his prison cell. Franz had written the letter, given it to his mum, who likely had no idea of the contents, but then posted it. The letter was then sent to France's solicitor, who handed it to his mum, who in turn handed it to him, bringing the whole ill-thought-through plot to an end. Strangely, handwriting experts were unable to confirm whether France's handwriting matched the style of writing within the letter, but the 16 identifying characteristics found within the fingerprint all but confirmed he was the one who wrote it. The brick mentioned in the letter was soon recovered by detectives from the derelict chapel where the footprint had been discovered. On it were 33 human hairs, 10 of which forensic scientist Peter Lamb examined. Four of those were confirmed as matching Gillian's hair sample, five matched her eyebrow sample, and the tenth matched the eyelash sample. A total of 80 blue-black fibres were also recovered from the brick, which matched the same woolen material Gillian's jacket was made out of, and were the same colour. Further forensic evidence included blood spots located on France's jeans and a hair recovered from Gillian's thigh which matched France's. When the trial began at Leicester Crown Court on November 15th, 1983, France maintained his innocence. Case prosecutor Ian Black explained how France had used the house brick to bludgeon Gillian to death after first sexually assaulting and strangling her. 
This version of events came after France finally admitted to having killed Gillian during police interviews, but he maintained his innocence regarding having sexually assaulted the 14-year-old. France said, Look, I'm not denying I have done it, but I didn't rape her. I'm not the sort of animal that the press have made me out to be. The grim reality of the situation was that France had spotted Gillian riding her horse once while he was working on a house and began stalking her. Watching her from outside her school, he groomed her into a sexual relationship and took advantage of her multiple times. On the evening of her murder, Franz claimed to have had consensual sex with Gillian twice, hence his denial of having raped her. He said they met at the village bridge at roughly half eight on the evening of April 14th, walked hand in hand to Eric Butterworth's garden by way of the derelict chapel, and had sex. France's excuse for having killed Gillian was due to her expressing concern when she felt she might become pregnant. Talk about victim blaming. After killing Gillian, Franz said he phoned his brother-in-law, Robert Winfield, who picked him up. Once home, he had a cup of tea and a bath. The irony of that claim is that France attempted to pin Gillian's murder on Robert by stating he had written the letter. For the record, Robert was arrested twice in connection with Gillian's murder, once on April 28th and once on May 3rd. Having said that, he was never formally charged with anything, and none of the forensic evidence matched any of the samples taken from him. Nine days after the trial opened, the jury of nine men and three women retired to deliberate, returning after just one hour and 45 minutes. They unanimously found Franz guilty of murdering Gillian, with Mr Justice Payne then handing him a life sentence. The judge said, I do not propose to make any recommendation to this case, and I don't think there is anything more to say. I sentence you to life imprisonment. With her killer now incarcerated, Gillian Atkins's memory lived on at some of the pony and riding clubs she was a member of by way of having some cup competitions named after her. I read a few horse riding articles which mentioned people winning the Gillian Atkins Memorial Cup and Gillian Atkins Trophy. That shows just how revered she was in those circles. Franz served a total of 27 years in prison before finally being released on April 28th, 2010. He was initially released in July 2007, but was recalled eight months later after committing a public order offence. Whilst on the inside, he acquired a heroin addiction and reportedly attempted to take his own life on several occasions by way of slashing his wrists and swallowing a sharp piece of metal. On October 2nd, 2010, just over five months after being released from his 27-year stay behind bars, Franz decided to burgle a couple's house in Peterborough whilst they were out. The method of entry matched his previous convictions all those decades ago, so he was a key suspect immediately. His blood was also recovered from the scene, so the police knew it was him. He quickly admitted being responsible once police caught up with him, and he was handed a five-year prison sentence for his efforts on March 11th, 2011, after pleading guilty. I'll conclude this story by filling you in on what's happened to Gillian's family since she was taken away from them far too soon, 40 years ago. Arnold Atkins chose to take early retirement and never worked again after his daughter died. He purchased a horse of his own, perhaps to somehow feel close to Gillian now that she was gone, but it didn't prevent Arnold from continuing to be emotionally destroyed. Elaine focused all her love and attention on breeding West Highland White Terriers, and to be fair, she was pretty good at it, even to the point where she was successful at Crufts, but it came at the expense of sacrificing her relationship with her remaining loved ones. The family was torn apart after what happened to Gillian. Arnold and Graham went years without speaking after a big family rift and only exchanged the briefest of words at Elaine's funeral after she passed away in December 2013, aged 68. Arnold then passed away on June 1st, 2022, aged 87, leaving Graham as the only Atkins left. It made me think of a true crime panel I recently attended in which the point was reiterated that we must remember the victims of tragedies such as this one don't end with the person killed. Their family members and friends are victims too. It's important not to forget that. Graham has struggled immensely since his little sister was taken away from him and he's had his fair share of personal tragedies, but I'm going to respect his privacy by not divulging some of the sensitive things he's told me about himself. I'll end now with a quote from Graham that hit me right in the feels. Grief didn't unite our family. It ripped it apart. 
And that was the story of the murder of Gillian Atkins. Thanks again, Graham Atkins, for suggesting that case. I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on it. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or donate on a one-off basis via Buy Me A Coffee, you can find the links for each on BritishMurders.com. Thank you, hello, and welcome to my newest Patreon member, The Wannabe Wolf. Thank you, Felicity, Anne Biggins, Courtney, and Barry McGuigan for buying me some beers at BuyMeACoffee.com slash BritishMurders. Please continue emailing case suggestions to BritishMurdersPodcast at gmail.com or message me via social media. You'll not only get the episode covered, but you'll get a cheeky shout out too. And that's it for another episode. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.